Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day two here in Norway at Norway Chess, one of the most exciting events of the year. The best chess players on the planet are here in Stavanger, Norway, and are battling over the chessboard every single day. Yesterday, we've seen an incredible game between Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces and, of course, Fabi. Fabi took Magnus down and he was leading, co leading the event going into day two alongside Gukesh, who also won in classical portion. As I was saying yesterday, this Norway chess has a very intriguing format because uh, on top of classical games, if the game ends in a draw in classical, then the players are going to move to an Armageddon where white gets 10 minutes, black gets 7 and black has draws. Today Fabiano is facing Anish Giri with the black pieces. Let's see what happens. Anish Giri with the white pieces, Fabi with the black pieces. Anish starts with 1d4, knight f6, c4, and now e6. We've seen this from Fabiano quite a lot recently. And generally, he's uh, going to uh, hint potentially to either a Ragozin. This is what we've seen uh, from him uh, quite often in Tata Steel. He has other things in his repertoire as well. But in today's game, Anish decided to go with knight c3, inviting the Nimzo with the move bishop to b4, which Fabiano accepts. f3, this is uh, the first big surprise of the game. Anish has not played this very often in classical chess. He's played it online quite a few times, and even recently he's uh, tried it in online events, which, to be honest, nowadays uh, comprise pretty much the bulk of games that an elite, pretty much any chess player on the planet is uh, playing over the course of uh, the year because most of the tournaments are online. So definitely you have to check pretty much everything. You have to analyze what your opponents play online. You have to analyze what your opponents play over the board. In this case, he goes for this move f3, which is a very aggressive way of dealing with the Nimzo. White immediately wants to take the center, play the move e4, and next, of course, this has its drawbacks. First of all, this knight on g1, whenever there is a pawn on f3, is going to have quite a difficult time finding a good spot in the position. You have a couple of options later on, most likely is going to land on e2, something along the lines of e4, bishop to d3, and get the knight on e2 afterwards. This is the dream scenario for white. Let's see what happened. Of course, black in this position has a lot of ways. d5 is one of them and pretty much one of the main lines in the position. Black can also play castle, black can also play c5, and many other moves. At d5, a3, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and c5. One of the most topical lines in uh, this particular opening. Take on d5 and another big ramification for black. You can take with the pawn, you can also take with the knight. If you take with the pawn, then we're most likely going to see um, structures such as e3, maybe um, castle, bishop to d3, and now in general, black goes for the exchange of the light square uh, bishops with a move b6, knight to e2, and bishop to a6, and then we get this type of crazy positions in which uh, white has a pretty bad bishop for the moment. But in case this pawn is going to land on e4 and this bishop is going to open up, white is going to have a very beautiful position. So this is the battle in this structure. White is trying to get e4, black is trying to stop white from going e4. And of course, as you can probably tell by now, black has a very compact structure and most likely structurally it is white who is facing and uh, having some weaknesses in the position. Let's get back to the game. In this instance, Fabiano decides to go with knight takes d5, d takes c5, and now queen to a5, e4, and um, knight to e7. Knight takes c3 is a pretty bad move in the position. In general, you do not want to accept this uh, pawn on c3, because after queen to d2, the problem is the pawn on c3 was blocking my dark square bishop. And in this case, my next move is going to be bishop to b2. Not only that, I'm going to attack your knight 
on uh, C3, but also whenever you move it away, because you will have to move it away, you have to uh, deal with the pin right now. So you have to defend the queen with knight C6, bishop to B2, and now finally you can go knight to A4. The problem is that I will take, take, and now you have some weaknesses on the long diagonal. My bishop is an absolute monster. I will take on g7. You're pretty much lost at this point, despite the fact that the pawns might even be equal. Let's say rook to g8. I'm not even going to defend. I'm not going to go bishop d4. I'm going to go bishop to f6. You can take this pawn on a c5, but after rook to c1, you have so many problems. As uh, black, you have to fight off a, a very, very potent bishop pair in uh, this instance and this one is just uh, not looking good for you. So after e4, queen to c3 is also not a good move. Knight to e7 is uh, the topical line. Knight to f6 is also a move. My arrows are uh, horrendous. Knight to f6 is also a move. Um, I don't think knight c7 is a move in this position, but knight to e7 is one of uh, the topical lines. Bishop to e3 once again. White is inviting black to take on c3. Black is saying, no, I'm not going to open up this long diagonal. I do not need this pawn. I want to take this pawn on c5 at some point. As we will see, black is going to try to corral that pawn on c5. Castle, queen to b3, queen to c7, bishop to b5, and knight to c6. Knight to e2, and knight to a5. What I'm trying to get as um, black is, if you allow me to, at some point, get knight to d7, knight takes c5. That's why white is going to go queen to b4 and stay close to the pawn on uh, c5. If you go something like queen to c2 after knight d7, you don't have a clear way of uh, defending this pawn on c5. And in fact, most likely the position is already starting to look quite good for black because you have a very good structure once you recapture this pawn on c5. All right. Let's keep going. Queen to b4, knight to c6, and queen to a4. Knight to e5, and bishop to d4. And I want you guys to see something in the position right now. Take note of uh, the times at this point. 1 hour and 34 minutes for Fabiano against 57 minutes for uh, Anish. And they started with 2 hours on their clock. So at this point already, there was a pretty clear signal that Fabiano definitely has won the opening battle. He knew the positions better. And by the way, they are both following a very um, topical line right now, one of the main lines. But from their discussion afterwards, it seems like Anish was not really aware of uh, the exact precise moves. With that being said, he was still making the best moves in the position up to this point. Knight to g6. Black is trying to go e5, get the bishop out with bishop to e6, keep the knight close to uh, the king so that this king is going to be quite well protected. And um, once again, focus on the weakness on c5. Castle, e5, bishop to f2, and bishop to e6. You have to defend against all sorts of knight to b3 right now with the bishop on e6. So white played the move rook to b1. Not only that, but also the rook on uh, a semi-open file. Targeting and eyeing that pawn on b7 makes a lot of sense, right? So rook to b1, definitely all good up to this point. A rook to d8. And at this point, white had and probably maybe it was in Anish's notes uh, before the event or who knows, whenever he uh, prepared uh, this line. Knight to d4 in this position was a very beautiful move. Probably the best objectively and uh, it would be leading to quite a complicated battle because white sacrifices a piece at the same time it creates this majestic center in the position you still have very um, uncoordinated pieces as black you can see these two knights are kind of separated from each other the bishop is going to be targeted after the move a d5 this bishop protects and supports the expansion of uh, the pawns in the center and on the queen side so definitely the compensation is visible in the position at the same time this is a big risk you're taking if you play the move knight to d4 and um, let's not forget, the format is unforgiving. You do not get a lot of extra time. First of all, if you don't make it to move 40, then you don't get any uh, increment at all. 
After move 40, you only get 10 seconds every single move. So if you drop down to your last few minutes, you're going to be in big trouble. In this tournament, there is no second time control. So this is something that probably Anish took into consideration as well. And we can already see he's down to his last 47 minutes, one hour and 17 for Fabiano. So quite a significant time edge for um, Fabi. For that reason, Anish made a mistake. He played a move queen to c2. Probably he just forgot about this, that after a6, you cannot go back to d3 because of a bishop to b3, and now you're in trouble. Because if you take on b3, then I just simply take, take, and now you're losing uh, the bishop on d3, you're in exchange down, you're in big trouble. If you go to d2, to continue defending this uh, bishop on d3, then I can go knight to c4 once again, take advantage of the fact that you are pinned down the d file, and this one is not looking great. I mean, sure, we're going to exchange, we're going to take, I'm going to take on b3, but then I just simply go knight to d2, pick up one of uh, the rooks, that's an exchange. This one is looking tremendous. This one is in fact winning for uh, black. So definitely not something that Anish wanted to see. And after the move a6, he played the move bishop to a4, the only move in the position, and he was playing it quite fast quickly at this point. Knight to c4, uh, rook to d1 played quite quickly as well. You have to defend against knight to d2 or rook to d2. These are very serious threats in the position. You have to defend on the d file, but unfortunately for you, that allows me to pick up the pawn on a3 like a thief. <laughs> and I think this is uh, what they mentioned during the official uh, broadcast. They were just saying that, you know, Fabi came in, uh, stole the pawn on a3 and got back to c4. A very nice bargain for black, for Fabi. So at this point, I was looking at the game, I was following the game, I was analyzing with a pretty strong engine uh, live, and uh, it was looking good. I think the very strong engine was saying something along the lines of minus 0 0.8, so definitely a significant advantage for uh, Fabiano. Nevertheless, the pawns are still equal. Because, let's not forget, Black sacrificed uh, one pawn at, at the beginning of the game, in the opening phase. So, Black is not a pawn up. Nevertheless, with the pawns being equal, you still have some weaknesses to work against. While my pawn structure is extremely compact as Black. So, definitely advantage Black at this point. Bishop to b3, h6. And I think this was a um, slow move by Fabi. Definitely something that feels very natural, because you want to make uh, luft, you want to make some space for your king, but what you have to prioritize at this point is speed. And what he had to do was play the move a5. This was the best move in the position. Try to go a4, a3, take advantage of the fact that you just took the pawn on a3 and there's no opponent on the a file. Push him, baby. Push the pawn. This probably would have given um, black quite a significant edge, not decisive by any means, but very, very significant in the position. He played the move h6, h4, Anish was uh, speeding up at this point, not making the best moves, but definitely being practical, because you have to um, make moves fast. You cannot allow yourself to get down to your last few minutes. Queen to c6, perhaps a better move once again, would have been a5. Continue pushing the pawn. Queen to c6, my guess is that Fabi wanted to go queen to b5 and start looking at this bishop on b3. Start trying to accommodate the bishop on uh, b3. h5, knight to e7. I want to say knight to f8 was probably the better move in the position. It's not easy um, to make this decision, but at the same time, and I will try to, try to uh, explain to you why. The knight on f8, I'm going to go to d7 and then I'm going to target the pawn on uh, c5. Not only that, but I have ideas of knight to f6, knight takes h5 as well, though those are much more difficult to, um, to happen. What he was tempted by, my guess, is that after knight to e7, which was played in the game, this knight nicely protects the square f5. So ideas of knight to g3, knight to f5, no longer work as well. And, um, you know, I can understand that. I can give props to 
to King's safety. So knight to e7, maybe objectively not the best move, but not something that surprised me and not something that I can condemn at all. Rook takes d8, rook takes d8, rook to d1, and now rook to d7. Perhaps, once again, not a very precise move. Uh, much better would have been to take, take, and just simply play the move king to h7. Though once again, this is still not an easy move, uh, because after the move queen to uh, d8, what you have to understand is that you can just simply go knight to g8. It's not pretty, it's not a beautiful move, but it's a useful move, and it's a move that pretty much solves all your problems, because, and as I was mentioning uh, and alluding uh, to even before, I might get to f6 at some point and start targeting the pawn on h5. You cannot move with this bishop, you cannot switch diagonals, because that's going to lose you the c5 pawn. And if you lose the c5 pawn, you're in big, big trouble. Not only that you lose that, but my queen invades as well. So this would have probably given Fabi a significant edge. He played the move rook to d7, queen to a1, queen to c8, and knight to d4. A very well-timed, finally, and perhaps this would have been the last moment when Anish can play this move knight to d4 and create this sacrifice. It's very good, and most likely after this move knight to d4, white manages to objectively get closer and closer. Uh, to equality. So take on d4, take on d4, a b5, you have to defend this knight on c4 because otherwise after the move d5, the action and the defense of the bishop on e6 is going to be cut and this knight on c4 is going to remain restrained. So you don't want that. Defend that knight with a move b5, take on b6, take on b6 and now d5. That's going to allow white to get the piece back because, well, you don't really have a lot of squares to put that bishop on. <laughs> so you have to give up uh, the knight. Knight takes d5, take on d5, knight takes d5. Black still has an extra pawn, but unfortunately this position, after the exchange that will most likely come in uh, the position, the bishop on b3 for the knight on d5, we're going to see the presence of the different opposite color bishops. There we go. I don't even remember how opposite color bishops are called, but we know that opposite color bishops have a tendency to uh, hint at very equal positions, despite of the fact that maybe one of the sides has some material advantage, which is the case in this um, situation. The pawn on a6 is extra. So, bishop to a4, rook to b7, rook to c1, rook to c7, the exchanges, and now finally Anish is ready to exchange on d5 and um, get into this endgame. a5, take on d5, take on d5, queen to d4. What Anish is trying to get is most likely a battery on the long diagonal so that I can start attacking this pawn on g7 and force the weakness of the black king. Bishop to b3, queen to b6, I'm harassing you, I'm trying to exchange the queens. If I manage to exchange the queens, this uh, endgame is going to be a draw. Queen to c5, Fabi's running away from the exchange of the queens, uh, understandably so. And bishop to e6, bishop to d4, queen to a2, and bishop to c3. A very precise and very good move in the position. For example, if you go queen to e5, then I go f6, and it's not that easy anymore. And think about it this way. If I manage to go bishop to f7 and perhaps pick up the pawn on h5, then you're probably lost. So... Anish had to find something very smart in the position. He had to find a way to uh, give another check on this diagonal after the move king to h7. So, how did he do that? He played the move bishop to c3 first. a4, you have to move uh, the pawn, otherwise you lose it. Queen to d4, and I created this battery once again, but from a different position of the queen. Now after f6, I can give you a check, and I have another check on the b1 h7 diagonal. Very, very important detail. And this is why these players are so, so good. King to h8, queen to d8, bishop to g8, and bishop to f6. If you take back like this, this is just simply going to be a perpetual check. Check, 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 draw. So Fabi plays his last chance, queen to f7. We see an exchange of uh, the pawns, but unfortunately this only helps uh, white because you gave 
a weakness, the pawn on h5, for a very strong and very good defender, the pawn on f6, which was covering up this long diagonal. Now you're going to have to uh, set up a few extra resources, defensive resources, to defend on g7 against uh, this uh, very annoying battery, and that's not going to allow you to get to my king. So this queen is going to have to stay next to your pawn, and unfortunately will not be able to be used to attack uh, the white king. That means this position right now is an easy draw, and the players know it, and the players do it. Right now, what white needs to do is give this bishop for uh, this pawn and get the king in the corner. If you manage to do that, then this is pretty much game over. King to c1, bishop to a2, king to c2, king to c3, we shuffle up, and nothing will be happening. This is an easy draw, very nice save by um, uh, Anish, but also a very encouraging sign for Fabiano with the black pieces. Easy defense, well, uh, easy equalizing out of the opening, and I have to say, he got the advantage out of the opening. So this was a very good sign. Now, I'm going to quiz you guys. What happens in case in classical chess, the players make a draw? Pause the video. Well, they go into an Armageddon, and this is exactly what happened. 20 minutes after this game was done, Fabiano once again had to defend the black side of the equation uh, against uh, Anish. 10 minutes for Anish, 7 minutes for Fabiano, no increment at all, up until move 40. After move 41, you get 1 second every time you make a move. That's not a lot. So do not allow yourself to get down to the last few seconds. You have to play fast. The strategy is very easy. The colors remain the same. Anish with white, Fabi with black. Let's see what happened in the second game. Anish, and by the way, they were speeding through the first few moves. Anish was trying to put a lot of pressure out of the opening. And I'm going to go through this one much quicker. C4, knight f6, g3, e6. We have a uh, Catalan. Castle, castle, d4, take on c4, queen to c2, and we have one of uh, the most topical and main lines of the Catalan, bishop to c6, bishop to f4, bishop to d6, knight c3, inviting this trade. We see a slight imbalance in the structure. We have uh, double pawns on the f-file which for white, which allows uh, white to get some activity on the g-file, which Anish does. a5, e3, knight to a6, and h3. He's trying to get the king to h2 and then pile up on the g-file, which is exactly what happened. Knight to b4, king to h2, g6, rook to g1, and queen to e7. I really like uh, what Fabi is playing, and as you can see, if you are following the time, and you should be, because that's part of the strategy of uh, this game, you can see at this point Anish had 9 minutes and 43 seconds, so he only spent 17 seconds, and uh, Fabi had 6 minutes and 23 seconds, definitely feeling the heat. The time is going down very, very quickly in this one. Knight to g5, the first time Anish uh, spent some time on his decision, inviting this trade, rook to c8, and Fabiano is not hiding his intentions. He's trying to get c5 in. He's trying to open up the center. He's trying to uh, exchange the pawn on c7 for the pawn on d4. And that's going to allow him to get his pieces active with the opening of the d file. I'm going to get the rook via the d file in as well. This is looking good if you manage to do so. So white goes knight to e4, trying to stop the move c5. B6, once again, reinforcing ideas of C5 later on. Rook to G5. It's all about stopping black from going C5. And now Fabiano finds a very nice idea. Take, take. You didn't stop me. You did not stop me from playing C5. Guess what? You take. I'm not going to take back. Don't take back. This would be terrible. I will take back on C5 and you actually just lose a pawn. But you have an intermezzo f5, beautiful move, hitting the knight on e4 and cutting the action of the rook on g5. At the same time, it has some drawbacks. Once you play the move f5, you will have a very serious weakness on the pawn on uh, g6, and white's plan becomes very clear. I want to play h4, h5, and get to that pawn on g6. If I manage to do so, your king might be in danger. Serious danger. Knight to c3, 
Rook to c5, queen to e2, and Fabi understands that he needs to do something, he needs to find counterplay, and he needs to do it fast, because once again, if you allow me a few more moves, h4, h5, game is over. e5, Fabi strikes in the center, Rook to g1, King to h8, this was a key move in the position, get off the g file as fast as possible, because otherwise you have to deal with all sorts of uh, unpleasant ideas. For example, if you take on f4, guess what? I'm going to take on g6, take on g6, take on g6, king f7, queen to h5. And it's not easy to understand what's happening in this position, especially not with five minutes on the clock and no increment. If he would have had more time, probably he would have went for this because queen to e5 in fact saves uh, the position for black. You're not getting checkmated. There's no discovery checks that pick up the queen in the position. So black in fact is doing quite well right now. You still have to fend off some checks. Rook takes b6, king to e7 and start, start running like this. But I mean, you are a rook up, so you're probably going to win this one. With that being said, Fabi decides to go king to h8. This is the very safe option. Queen to f3, you're still strategically much better as black. Take on f4, take on f4, and rook to d8. Fabi is playing very correct and very principled chess. Now I have control of all these central files. The queen is controlling the e file, the rook is ready to go to d2. This rook on a c5 is defending on f5, as well as keeping an eye on this knight on c3. Once you move the knight anywhere, I'm going to invade with the rook as well via the c2 um, the square. So this one is looking really good. Guess what white is going to do? h4, let's go. I'm trying to go h5. Rook to d3, critical moment, guys. Critical, critical moment. You are under fire as uh, white. Rook to d3, if you retreat as it happened in the game, you will see that things don't go very well. But at this point, white had a brilliant move at his disposal. And if you do want to try to find it, you probably should pause the video and once again, try your might. Because I have to say, and they were discussing after the game as well, in fact, they discussed this at dinner uh, because none of the players spotted this resource during the game. Even after the game, none of the, player, none of the players spotted it. But with the help of the engines, with the help of your smartphone, immediately as they looked at the game and analyzed it, they saw what they missed. Queen to a8 was played, but queen to h5 was the brilliancy in this position. You cannot take because of rook to g8. That's a checkmate in one move. And there's a big threat right now. I'm just simply threatening to take on g6. The only move, in fact, or the only couple of moves is either rook to d6 or rook to c6 to try to defend from the sixth rank. But I have to say, I'm looking at the position and you're going to lose a pawn. I'm going to take on g6. You're going to take back on g6. This king is kind of there on h8 doesn't have any defenders around it, I would have been scared. If I would have seen this move land on the board queen to h5 with only three minutes, no increment, I have to make moves fast, I cannot allow myself to get down to my last minute. If I see queen h5, I start panicking in this position. I don't know what would have happened, I don't know how Fabi would have reacted, but it would have been a very difficult moment. So queen to h5, white's last chance to uh, make his attack successful. Queen to a8, rook to d8, and queen to g2 was what Anish decided to go for, but this just simply allows me to get my knight into play with knight to d3. This is uh, nicely targeting your weaknesses, f4, f2 as well, queen to f3, rook to c4, reinforcing the threat uh, against the pawn on f4, and it's very difficult to defend against it. If you go knight to e2, I have options, one of them being that I can even just simply exchange the queens with queen to e4. I'm probably not going to go for this, but I can do this because, let's not forget, black has draw odds, so with a draw, well, uh, the match is going to be over. So he did not play knight to e2, he played queen to g3, rook to f4, f3, and now a very nice way to finish this game was the move h6. Beautiful game by Fabiano, of course. The idea is that if you take on g6, I'm simply going to take on h4, force the king 
on G2, give you a check on F4, and <laughs> if you go here, then I can go rook to D1. That's a nice way to finish the game. You cannot take it because of queen to E2. And if you go king to F2, queen to C5, that's a checkmate in one move as well. So, a beautiful way to uh, end the Armageddon for Fabiano with this victory in the Armageddon. He gets one and a half points. So in the first round, by winning in the classical game, he got three points. One and a half points for winning in the Armageddon. Anish gets only one point for losing in uh, the Armageddon. So right now, Fabiano is on four and a half points out of six uh, total possible points. Half a point behind is Sikaru, who uh, won in classical against Gukesh. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Abdul Satorov, who won against Aryan Tari in classical as well. He lost the, the Armageddon, both of them actually, Hikaru and uh, Nodirbek Abdul Satorov, lost the Armageddon in yesterday's matches. So, Fabi leading after two. Tomorrow he will be facing with the white pieces uh, a player that is uh, struggling in this event, the uh, lowest rated player in the event, Aryan Tari. So, definitely. An important opportunity for Fabi to try to take uh, the full points home. We'll see what happens and I will see you guys tomorrow.